Last week we saw the uh, people of God gathering together in Jerusalem for a, a great day of reading of Scripture. And uh, today we pick up the story uh, again in chapter 9. So page 493 in your pew Bibles, Nehemiah chapter 9. And before we read God's Word, let's pray for God's help uh, to understand it and to be transformed by it. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we uh, come before you today uh, aware of our weakness in many ways, aware of our failures to live uh, as you have called us to. And Father, as we uh, read your word today, we pray that you would uh, illumine our minds. Give us understanding, our Father, into your word, and may we be changed by it. Fill us, we pray, through the power of your spirit as we read your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's hear God's word. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the wickednesses of their fathers. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshipping the Lord their God. Standing on the stairs were the Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kanani, who called with loud voices to the Lord their God. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Habashaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pehathiah, said, stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you and you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous You saw the sufferings of our forefathers in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of the land. For you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they passed through it on dry ground. But you hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way they were to take. You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right, and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath, and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger you gave them bread from heaven. And in their thirst, you gave them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. But they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked and did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore you did not desert them, even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt or when they committed awful blasphemies. 
Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the desert. By day, the pillar of cloud did not cease to guide them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. For 40 years, you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. You gave them kingdoms and nations, allotting to them even the remotest frontiers. They took over the country of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. You made their sons as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you brought them into the land that you told their fathers to enter and possess. Their sons went in and took possession of the land. You subdued before them the Canaanites who lived in the land. You handed the Canaanites Canaanites over to them, along with their kings and the peoples of the land, to deal with them as they pleased. They captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took possession of houses filled with all kinds of good things, wells already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate to the full and were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness." But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They put your law behind their backs. They killed your prophets who had admonished them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. So you handed them over to their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. And from heaven you heard them. And in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hand of their enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven. And in your compassion, you delivered them time after time. You warned them to return to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, by which a man will live if he obeys them. Stubbornly they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked, and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them. By your spirit you admonished them through your prophets. Yet they paid no attention, so you handed them over to the neighboring peoples. But... In your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now, therefore, O our God, the great, mighty, and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come upon us, upon our kings and leaders, upon our priests and prophets, upon our fathers and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have been just. You have acted faithfully while we did wrong. Our kings, our leaders, our priests and our fathers did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the warnings you gave them even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our forefathers so that they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. And this is God's word. Well, so far this morning, we have been remembering, especially today, with thankfulness, how God has been our help in ages past. 
And it's good, it's appropriate to do that, isn't it? Uh, to look back and to say thank you for how God has protected us and shown his mercy to our nation and enabled us to enjoy the peace that we have today. It's also good, I think, as we do that, to ask how we can be sure that God will be our hope for years to come. In our scripture reading this morning, we get to observe a great act of remembrance. The people of God gather together in Jerusalem to remember God's faithfulness in the past and to entrust themselves to him again for the years to come. We're in the second half of the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And if Nehemiah is known for anything, he's known for this project of rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem after they had been destroyed by an invader 150 years before. But that project is finished now. It took the first half of the book. And now in the second half of the book, Nehemiah has another, possibly more challenging project to undertake. And this is rebuilding the hearts of the people. They too have been shattered by their defeat uh, all those years ago. And now Nehemiah needs to kind of re-encourage them and inspire them so that they're willing to trust themselves to God again and to come and live as the people of God in the city of God, Jerusalem. Well, last week we saw a key way that that begins to happen. Uh, The people gather together for a great day of hearing God's word as Ezra the scribe uh, reads for three hours and explains the meaning of God's word. And interestingly, the initial response of the people to that reading of God's word was weeping. And that turned out to be the wrong response. Nehemiah intervened And he said, do not grieve, Uh, chapter 8, verse 10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The people were in danger, it seems, of sort of missing the big point of the Bible, which is that it is to help us to rejoice in God and his salvation. And so the people uh, didn't weep, they instead Uh, rejoiced in God. They actually discovered as they carried on reading that they were meant to be celebrating one of the great feasts of the Old Testament, the Feast of Tabernacles, when the people remembered how God had brought them out of Egypt through the wilderness to the Promised Land. And so they went and they celebrated that festival for eight days. Uh, And then they took a day off, uh, and that brings us to the 23rd day of the month. And then we find at the start of our reading today, chapter 9, verse 1, On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. Well, we may be thinking, this is a bit strange. Have they forgotten the lesson that they learned the very previous week? Have they kind of reverted to being spiritual eels and they need to be encouraged again? Well, not this time. Nehemiah doesn't step in to stop this. In fact, the people go on to produce this great confession. And it seems to me that there is a time both for dancing and also for mourning in the Christian religion. As the people rejoiced in all that God had done for them, In the past, they also had to recognize just how far short they had fallen of treating God in the way that he had treated them. And so they gathered together now, wearing sackcloth and with dust on their heads. They gather for three more hours of reading and preaching from the Bible, and then three hours of confession and worship. This is a really serious response to God, isn't it? And it makes you think, if we have a sense that things aren't just the way that they should be in our lives or in the lives of our nation at the moment, would we be up for doing something like this? It's a pretty serious response, isn't it? Uh, I was interested to see uh, a couple of days ago on BBC Breakfast, uh, Harry Billinge, the D-Day veteran who's now 94, who was asked to talk about D-Day. And at the end of his interview, he was asked by the interviewers to, to give a sort of a message for today's generation about D-Day. And he said, well, we, um, 
the, the king that he served under, George VI, uh, wanted to have days of prayer. And he said, we should have a month of prayer now because we're, we've got so much to be thankful for, but we barely give God a thought today. And he goes on and he says, we're so clever we could blow each other up, but we don't love one another. So it seems to me Harry Billinge and the generation perhaps of his day would look at us today and say, why aren't you praying more? Why aren't you gathering together like the people in Nehemiah chapter 9? So I hope that we can learn something from their prayer today. And wonderfully, we have in verses 5 through to 38 a record of the sorts of prayers that were prayed that day. And really, these are all prayers of confession. But they're confession in two ways. The confession of sin goes hand in hand with confession of who God is. And we'll see that, I think, as we go through. The way that the people do this confession is they look back through their history, uh, all through the Old Testament, and they turn that into a confession both of God's faithfulness and of their unfaithfulness. Uh, This has been called, this prayer, one of the most complete summaries of the Old Testament to be found within the Old Testament itself. So if you're one of many of us who have often wondered to ourselves, what is the Old Testament all about? This is a great prayer for us to study this morning. In The first 26 verses of it cover the history of God's people all the way from the creation of the world through to the exile to Babylon, which was when the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. That's verses 5 through to 31. And then the closing uh, verses, verses 32 to 38, bring the story up to the present day. So I want to take uh, 10 minutes or so this morning to try and work through this amazing prayer of confession, and then we'll try to reflect on it together. Well, the prayer begins uh, where you might expect with creation, verse 6. You alone are the Lord, the people confess. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Creation tells us something very fundamental about God. It tells us that he is the only God. He is the only one who has created everything else that exists. And so he is the God who is worthy of all our praise. He and he alone should be worshipped. Uh, by us and by all the multitudes of heaven. So we begin with God the creator. But the book of Genesis, which records creation, also has a second great event in it. And this is God the covenant maker. Verse 7. You are the Lord God, who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, And you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. So now we see God not only as the creator, but God as the righteous covenant maker and covenant keeper. And notice the pattern. God, first of all, does all these things for Abraham without any sense that Abraham deserves them. But then there is meant to be a response, and Abraham's heart was indeed faithful to God. And God then made him a promise to give him the land to his descendants, and that's going to be important in this prayer as we go through. But the next verses speed us on into the time of the Exodus, verse 9. You saw the suffering of our forefathers in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh against all his officials and all the people of his land, for you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. So you see, again, the people are wanting to see what they have learned about God through their history. God has made a name for himself, not only as the unique creator, not only as the righteous covenant-making God, but also now as the God who saves his people from affliction that comes through human arrogance. Do you see there? The Egyptians treated the people arrogantly. The next verses 
recount more of the amazing things that God did in saving his people, uh, splitting the sea, hurling the Egyptian army into the depths, leading them with the pillar of cloud and fire, coming down on Mount Sinai to speak with the people from heaven, making known the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments and the laws, giving bread from heaven and water from a rock. And then finally, verse 15, he told them to go in and take possession of the land that had been promised to Abraham. God is going to hand everything to these people on a plate. Uh, God promises in the book of Exodus that he will send his angel to go ahead of them to bring them into the land. And so the promises will be kept that God made all those years ago to Abraham. Well, that brings us up to Exodus chapter 31 in the Bible now, the second book of the Bible. But the people don't respond like Abraham. Verse 16. But they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked and did not obey your commands. And it's interesting to note here that the word for arrogance is the same word as the Egyptians' arrogance. So God's people have become just like the Egyptians who mistreated them. Verse 17, they forgot God's faithfulness. They refused to, they failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. And so in the pride of their hearts, they thought that they could do a better job governing themselves. So we've had God the creator, God the covenant keeper, God the almighty saviour. And now as we look for a response, we find the shock of instant adultery. Immediately the people just turn away from God, having seen all these amazing miracles. But wonderfully, this rebellion leads to a new revelation of God's nature. Verse 17 again. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them, even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt, or when they committed awful blasphemies. So we've had God, the only creator, God, the righteous covenant keeper, God, the powerful saviour, and now we have God, the forgiver, the compassionate God. And really this word that's sometimes translated as compassion, sometimes sometimes translated as mercy, is really the key word about God for the rest of this prayer. As God is confronted over and over again by human rebellion and sin, time and time again, God shows his compassion. And so instead of abandoning the people in the desert, he gives them everything that they had previously. And he gives them his good spirit to instruct them, uh, giving them the book of Leviticus, the third book in the Bible. And then verse 21 summarizes the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, the fourth and fifth books of the Bible. For 40 years you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. And so now the next generation is ready to take possession of the land. Verse 24, their sons went in and took possession of the land. And this brings us to the book of Joshua, the sixth book in the Bible, which home groups are reading uh, about at the moment. And they've been learning how the people captured fortified cities and fertile land. And so God's people were at last able to enjoy life in the good land that God had promised. Verse 25, they ate to the full and were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness. But it's not long before the next generation themselves turns away. Verses 26 to 27 uh, take us into the time of the judges, uh, recounted in the seventh book of the Bible. Uh, And that doesn't stop happening. God, as soon as the people turn away, uh, God punishes them. They cry out to God. God sends them deliverers or judges. But then verse 28, as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. 
Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion you delivered them time after time. So we see again and again God's compassion. And again and again, we see instead of a response that is appropriate to that, we see the crushing reality of continual disobedience, time after time. And many of us will know at various points in our own lives what that has felt like. Well, this cycle of disobedience continues on through the times of the monarchy, described in the next books of the Bible, in the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. And you can see that in verse 29 and following. But this cannot go on forever, this cycle. And so, verse 30, for many years you were patient with them. By your spirit you admonished them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you handed them over to the neighboring peoples. This brings us up now to the time of the exile, This is the final handing over of the people to the kingdoms of Assyria, uh, who take away the northern kingdom, and then Babylon, uh, a century or so later, take away the southern kingdom and destroy the city of Jerusalem. But the story isn't over. Verse 31. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Even the exile did not bring an end to God's relationship with his people. They were exiled, but they were not abandoned. So there you go, that's the short history of God's people all the way from Genesis through to Chronicles. Uh, We've covered about 470 pages of the Bible at breakneck speed there. But if if even that was kind of too much and we've kind of lost the thread, there's a summary of the summary in verse 33. Have a look at that. In all that has happened to us, the people confess, you have been just, you have acted faithfully, while we did wrong. So you see, this prayer really is a confession in these two senses. It's a confession that God is righteous, God is just, God is good, God is faithful, God is compassionate, and we do wrong time and time again. It strikes me that in our sin, one of the things I think we often do is we almost try to entangle God into our mess. We sort of try to blame God for the situation that uh, he's allowed us to get into, or we kind of blame God for our faults and our failures. It seems to me that what confession does is it disentangles God from the mess that we've got ourselves into. In confession, we say that God is faithful. God is true. God is just. God is good. And we confess that we ourselves are proud, forgetful, disobedient. We continually forget God's goodness. Well, the prayer brings us then into the present day, verse 36. But see, the people say, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our forefathers, so that they could eat its fruit and the other things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. So you see, even though the people are now back in the land, even though Nehemiah's back and they've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, it's as though the exile hasn't really ever finished because they're still ruled over and oppressed by these foreign kings who do what they like with them. Uh, This is the Persian Empire that they're referring to here. And although God has been perfectly just, there is this sense that the current situation that the people are in is not what God's intention has been all along for this people. And so they are crying out now to God. And that brings us to a verse that we have slipped over, uh, verse 32. Now therefore, 
O our God, the great, mighty, and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. Now, I want to slow down here and think about this verse now for a little bit uh, together. Because I think of all this great prayer, I have been most impressed by this verse. And even just half a verse in it. Because in all this prayer, this, as far as I can see, is the only request that the people make of God. Just half a verse, do you see it? Do not let all this hardship seem, like trif- seem trifling in your eyes. Blink, and you miss it, don't you? I actually listened to a great sermon on this passage last night, and the, the, the uh, preacher didn't even mention this verse. Uh, he mentioned lots of other very good things, but it's that easy to miss. This is the only request that the people make. And I think this shows us two critical attitudes that are, that are at the very heart of this great prayer and of all great prayer. And the first is this. This prayer shows real humility. All of this confession is not an attempt to sort of butter up God. There's no sense that the people are sort of saying, right, God, we've confessed, and now it's your turn to do your bit. All they do is offer this one short request, and it's so limited, isn't it? They don't even ask God to do anything concrete. All they say is, God, please don't let this all seem like nothing in your eyes. That's it. In 32 verses, they know they're at fault, and they simply throw themselves on God's mercy. So at the heart of this prayer is real humility. But second, there's also real trust in God's faithfulness. I think the reason that they're able to limit themselves to this one tiny request is because they've got this abundant trust in God's nature as the compassionate, gracious, forgiving God. They know that all they need to do is is place their situation before him and they can trust in his compassion. Lord, they're saying, you are the great and awesome God. You keep your covenant of love. You're faithful, far beyond what we deserve. Now, please, Have mercy on us again as you see our hardship. That's sort of what they're saying, but they don't need to spell it out like that because they've got so much confidence in who God is. They simply place themselves into his merciful hands. So real humility and real trust in God's faithfulness. Now, it might seem surprising, but there's no explicit element of repentance here in this prayer Where's the sense that the people are wanting to kind of turn back to God and change? Well, in fact, there is a a glimpse of that at the end of the prayer. You see in verse 38, the people say that they are making a binding agreement. And in chapter 10, we see more about what that agreement is, which we'll be looking at next week, God willing. But in short, it is a set of promises to change. So the people are also wanting to repent and do things differently. But at the heart of this prayer, I think, is really this this attitude of deep humility and deep trust in who God is. And I want to ask us, on this Sunday, where we've been giving thanks to God for his help in ages past, whether we approach God with this attitude today, this attitude of genuine, heartfelt confession, This morning, we've been remembering God's kindness to us in the 20th century in particular, as this country and others face powerful forces rising up that crushed millions and threatened to crush millions more. And God, in his mercy, did provide for that enemy to be destroyed. God was good to this nation and to the world. But what have we done with that? Have we remembered that mercy? Or have we as a society over the past 50 years taken the peace that was so dearly won for us and forgotten God's mercies to us as a nation? And instead of uh, trusting and reveling in his goodness, have we simply put his law 
behind our back. Uh, Henry, Harry Billinge, uh, the veteran on uh, the BBC uh, uh, breakfast program, continued to talk about his message for uh, the youth of today. And he, uh, he went on to say, uh, we haven't loved each other, and we need to turn from our ways, he says. And then he says, he's coming back. Our Lord Jesus is coming back. And the presenter says, Harry? Harry? Now, she's very polite about it, and to be fair, they let him uh, carry on. But you're half expecting Harry to be carted off uh, or the TV screen to go blue because you can't mention that. He's gone off script. It's all a bit awkward. And that's how society feels today, doesn't it, about God. Let's not go off script. Let's not go there. We've become arrogant. And when we get in trouble, that means that we look for somebody else to blame. Well, this prayer shows us that instead, we need to have humility before God. We need to say to him, Lord, you have acted faithfully, while we, we, here today, we did wrong. You see, these people are confessing things that they themselves didn't do, but they take it all as their history, their story, their sin. And we need to do that too, I think, as God's people. We don't want to blame Westminster. We don't want to blame Stormont. We don't want to blame all the secular people out there. We want to say that we too have done wrong. But with confession of sin comes the reminder of the great compassion of our God. As we exalt him, so we realize what an abundantly gracious God he is. We can't take God's mercy for granted, but we can always rely on it. God will always hear the cry of the brokenhearted. Well, I want to close by uh, pointing out just how God heard this cry uh, of, of this prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9. It wasn't really answered for uh, 400 years or so because God's people continued to be oppressed. The Persian Empire was replaced by the Greek Empire and then finally by the Roman Empire. In fact, I think you would have to say that this exile didn't come to an end until somebody was born in the days of Caesar Augustus to a woman of low estate in a stable in Bethlehem. But from there arose a saviour who would be king, not only of the Jews, but of the whole world. As Kanye West has recently reminded us, Jesus is king. And what a king he is. A few years ago, in her Christmas speech, Her Majesty the Queen made these comments. She said, Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that we sometimes need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness or our greed. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, important though they are, but a saviour, with the power to forgive. Well, history teaches that, and the Old Testament certainly teaches that we need a forgiving God. All around us, we see conflict, oppression, and distress, and the blame for that does not lie with God. He has been faithful, but we have done wrong. By nature, we are proud, rebellious, and forgetful. And that is why there is war and conflict today. But in his great compassion, God has not only sent us deliverers to rescue us from external enemies, but he has sent us his own son to be our saviour, to take away our sins. The Apostle Peter tells us that Jesus Christ bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. He tells us that Jesus died, the righteous one, for the unrighteous to bring us to God. As we sang earlier in those words written by Martin Luther, no man can glory in thy sight, all must alike 
confess thy might and live alone by mercy. That's the message of the Old Testament, I believe. That's the message of Nehemiah chapter 9, that we must and we can live alone by mercy. Won't we do that? Won't we entrust ourselves into the compassionate and gracious God, the God who is so faithful, even as we have done wrong, and find his mercy and his grace ready to help through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so through him and with him be praise and authority to the Father, with the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen.